Hey everyone, welcome to the Mighty Books Podcast, where we sit down and chat with mighty authors about their books, message, writing successes, struggles, and other relevant authorship topics. I'm your host, Ryan M. Oliver, author of the Beasts of Men and Gods series. Now let's get started on today's chat. This episode's featured author is Connie Connolly. Connie Hampton Connolly is a Tacoma fiction writer. Her novel, The Songs We Hide, set in communist Hungary, has been praised as a captivating masterpiece of historical fiction. Connie holds a BA in English from the University of Washington and a Master of Fine Arts degree in Creative Writing from Antioch University. She has worked as an editor and teacher, has written newspaper articles and magazine stories, and is currently writing another novel set in Hungary. Connie and her husband frequently travel abroad. Hello again and welcome back everyone to another episode of the Mighty Books Podcast. Today with me, we have Connie Connolly. Connie, how are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Excellent. My pleasure. So we're here to talk about your, your work, your, uh, your book. What is the title of your book? My book is titled The Songs We Hide. Can you tell us a little about uh, The Songs We Hide? Sure. It's historical fiction. It is set in Hungary in 1951, which was at the height of Stalinist communism. So I like to call it kind of a a story of love, fear, music, and communism, because it has all of those. And here's a, I guess, just kind of a one sentence summary of the book. In communist Hungary, a peasant loses his land, a young mother loses her baby's father, and both are scared into silence until music brings them together to face the agonizing tests ahead. So it's about two young singers, both of whom have tremendous pressure on their lives. Peter, because his family has been, has lost most of their land and can can no longer feed the family. And Catalin, the young woman, the father of her baby has been thrown in prison. So this is a story of a a musical friendship between these two hassled people uh, and the ways that they help each other and the ways that their relationship kind of gives them hope during a very, very dark dark period of their life. Wow. Sounds like a very powerful story. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So what inspired you to, to write this? I used to teach elementary music. And while I was doing that, I took some teacher training workshops in a methodology um, and music education methodology that was developed in Hungary. And the man who kind of headed that up was the composer Zoltan Kodai. And I did some reading about his life and I was just amazed at his creativity and how much he was able to help his country do something positive, namely staying involved in music, while his country was going through two world wars and a failed revolution, fascism, communism, and total economic wreckage. And so so I thought, I I love that. Um, Music at a time when everything is falling apart. And so that's kind of what inspired it. Are you Hungarian? No, I am not, but I I love music. And I was kind of intrigued with, Hungary has a very strong tradition of both folk music and classical music. Those are both my favorite kinds of music. So I, I kind of was able to identify with the, music of the country, but most of all, I just really cared about what the people had gone through. So, but not being Hungarian, is that, was that, did you find that pretty challenging to write about a different culture? Oh, definitely. Because before I started this, I, I really knew practically nothing about this country. And I, I really would not have expected to be writing about that, but I thought, well, I'll do some reading, I'll do some research, see if I'm really interested and want to continue. And then that country's story kind of pulled me in. So yeah, I did I did a 
ton of reading. Some of it was historical books. A lot of my information, very good information, in fact, came from um, memoirs that people wrote. I also interviewed some Hungarians who had lived through that time period, and that was amazing hearing their stories. But also another really wonderful thing that I did was to, I visited there, listened to Hungarian music, kind of got a feel for it. So I'm not Hungarian, but I, but by now I do know a lot about that country and that culture. So now you said you did interviews with those who lived during that time. Could you talk about what they went through, their stories? Yeah. Wow. Some, some of their stories were pretty hair raising. The people that I talked to, a few of them were in Hungary. I couldn't speak Hungarian, so I had to talk to them in English. Most of the people I interviewed were here, mostly in Seattle. Okay. And um, these were older people, of course, because I was asking about their experiences. A number of them told me about their escape from Hungary after the 1956 revolution. And so they told about, you know, having to watch for border guards, um, having to cross the border in the dark, then ending up in a refugee camp, going to a country where, you know, may they may or may not speak English and had to totally get started from the ground up. But I'll tell you some of the most interesting things that I found out, which then I ended up working into the book. A couple of women who were from a more well-to-do background, that was during a time when people who were from wealthier backgrounds were uh, being persecuted. Class enemies was what they were called. And so in 1951, during May of May and June of that year, there in not only in Budapest, but in some of the other cities, the secret police started showing up at the doors of uh, wealthy families, middle of the night, said, you have 24 hours to pack whatever you can take with you. You, you no longer get to live here. You are being deported to, they, they wouldn't say deported, they would say relocated. You are being relocated to, and it was usually some farm village way off in the middle of nowhere. And the parents would maybe work on a collective farm, whether or not they knew anything about farming, whether or not they had the health to do that. They lost their home and then the home was given to loyal party members. Uh, of course. And, and then when they moved, they would end up moving in with peasant families who were also being, who were also on the wrong side of the government. And so it was kind of a punishment on, on both sides. So uh, a couple of women told me their stories of this. One of them had gotten married at age 16 to try to avoid this kind of set up. So, so in my book, I incorporated that issue into the story. It's one of the subplots. And so I, I had one of the, one of the secondary characters um, having this happen to her family, and then having to get married to try to avoid this situation. Wow. That's insane. It, very, it was very, very hard on the people. Very oh, hard on them. Oh yeah, the very very strong people to have to go through something like that too. I mean, were they? Were, it was pretty obvious, probably when you're interviewing them. How just what did it, you think that affect their demeanor uh, and and everything else throughout their life like that? Just just from experience, those is at a young age. Yes, yes. One of them, all these years later, was still angry. <laughs> The other one, she had actually done very well in life over here, and I think felt more like, well, that was what happened. But then some of the other people that I talked to, their stories, they had very hard things happen to them, too. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they were able to talk more matter-of-factly about it. Sometimes the bitterness really would emerge after they began talking. Yeah. So yeah. People, people handle that kind of difficulty or 
that right. kind of trials and tribulations in, in different ways. And some people can handle it and compartmentalize better and heal after the fact. And others just have a hard time with that harsh reality. Yeah. 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 It, but it's very interesting that you actually got some, you know, one-on-one -on -one time with these, with these guys and gals who actually were there during this terrible time in their history. Yes. So you've got your first book here, but are you, are you working on a second book by chance? Yes. And this one is also set in Hungary and it is related to the songs we hide, although it's not a direct sequel. It's related in that one of the secondary characters in the songs we hide is the main character in this one. And so the, the current one that I'm working on, and I'm almost finished with it, the title is Fire Music. Ooh. And the, the main character is a violinist and it's a dual timeline book so when this when the book starts out uh Antal Varga the main character is 78 years old and the um story moves back and forth between him being 78 79 and back when he was 17 oh. during the siege of Budapest at the end of World War II so the total, the city was in absolute wreckage, total upheaval, a, a huge confrontation between the Russians and Germans going on right there in their city with Antal living in a bomb shelter. And so the story moves back and forth between what happened to him during the war and two generations later when younger members of the family are, are asking him Grandpa, what happened? And he does not want to talk about it. But little by little, the story comes out and kind of reopening it begins to bring about healing, not only for him, but for his family. Oh, very cool. So writing that must be, so are you finished writing the first draft? Yeah, I'm done with the first draft and I've done extensive editing on it. I'm doing one more round of revisions right now. Some other people are reading it for me and giving me comments. And then next week I jump into it in earnest. Isn't it fun to get back into it editing? Yeah. <laughs> it, it is. It's, it's definitely a trial. I'll say that. So with, with it being kind of that dual timeline, did you have to write it a certain way and then kind of fold it in on itself as it went? That's what I ended up doing. At first, I tried to go back and forth as I was writing it, and it it just was it just was really ungainly. And so finally, it dawned on me that, you know what? I need to finish the 1945 timeline first because that's kind of what the rest of the story is built around. yeah, so, so that's what I did. And then it then it became easier. But I, I have to say, nothing about that book was easy. <laughs> it it sounds incredibly interesting, though. I mean, I also love the title, Fire Music. That's just like, well, I want to check that out. Like, that just sounds, that will grab me and want me to pick it up, at least look on the back and read what it's about, you know what I'm talking about? So Thank that's, you. You, you got that part down. <laughs> the, 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 the plot sounds incredible, too. I'd love to love to dive deeper when I have a moment to do so. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So, so back to your first book. Um, yeah. What is one of the hardest scenes or chapters you had to write for that book? Well, I will say that in general with that book, plus the one that I'm writing now, usually the hardest scenes are, for me, are the scenes that are intensely emotional. And I really need the reader to feel with the characters or the scenes where there is just tons of action, maybe a fight going on. And so it's kind of like each step that the character takes has to be choreographed almost like a dance. That's very tricky and potentially frustrating, but also Writing the first scene is very difficult because it has to grab the reader's attention and interest, but there's also so much that the reader has to understand kind of right off the bat 
or at least understand well enough to progress into the story. Right. So usually, you know, usually writers end up revising the main, the first scene half a million times. Yeah, you're nodding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so those are difficult too. Very difficult. Yes, they are. I ended up my very when I finally finished the first draft. I'm so proud of myself. I go back to finally start editing. I read the first five words and I say, this is trash. I have to completely yeah. rewrite this. <laughs> right. So I did. I put a big red X's on all pages that were chapter one, rewrote it. And then I yeah. read it again and I edit it. And yep, yeah, it, it, it is a struggle. That first step, first step is hard, but you got to make it. You got to take the first step. Yeah. So would you mind reading that first scene for us? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, awesome. Thank you. So, as I mentioned, this is set in in Hungary in 1951, and the situation is that the the country has gone through a, a brutal transition to communism, and collective farming has not been implemented everywhere, but certainly. They are trying to implement it. The government is trying to implement it. And it's very frustrating for the peasants who don't want to join. And so my first scene opens in a farm village in Hungary. Okay. This is 1951. Six years after the war was lost, the spring harrowing still turned up bullets and mortar shell pieces in the fields every March. The farmers of Hevish County had grown used to this happening. The war's detritus was easier to live with than the shortages that should have ended by now, easier to deal with than the produce quotas for the good of the people. Peter Benedek, 22 years old, kicked away a gray shell fragment as he led two plow horses up the long, narrow field of newly sprouted wheat. His father paced behind anchoring and guiding the weed harrow. Not loudly enough for his father to hear, Peter sang to the mare beside him. She was temperamental since the war, and today she was teamed with a borrowed gelding. Peter's breath turned vapor in the morning cold as he sang. The mare's left ear turned toward him. Then it pricked forward toward the road. Peter eyed the source of the noise at the field's far end. With a muddy rumble, a black motor car pulled into view. A state car. There was no other kind here. Peter stopped singing. He looked over his shoulder at his father. Appa, he said. With a small pitch of his head, Peter indicated the road. They watched the car pull aside and break. The doors opened and three figures climbed out. Peter halted the horses. His right hand gripped the reins too tightly and he made himself ease up for the sake of the mare. Three of them this time, Appa muttered. His eyes slitted behind his high cheekbones as he squinted toward the road. The men crossed the field, a grim triangle, their forms blurring in the mist, then sharpening as they drew closer. Peter envied them their long warm coats. He recognized all the men. In back, the squat deputy, who had once been police chief here, and then the hulking younger man who had taken his job. In front walked Thomas Martin, the local party secretary who ran the communal farm. He was a little older than Appa, with red hair gone washwater gray and a brown mole under his eye. Peter remembered when the man used to share crop barley. The three stopped a few meters away. Martin touched one hand to his fur cap and gave a nod in greeting. Freedom. Peter glanced at his father. Appa only brushed a finger over his graying mustache. He had not shaved this morning and a sprinkle of stubble showed in the hollows above his jaw. Appa's gaze moved, gaze moved between the three men. The police chief set his hands on his service belt and drew back his shoulders. Peter tried to catch Appa's eye. Speak. Appa did not speak. 
Peter lifted the brim of his cap and summoned the saliva to his dry mouth. Good day, comrades, he said. Thomas Martin threw Peter a look but turned back to Appa. Yanshi Benedict, he said. Martin swept a gloved hand in a downward arc left to right. This is not your land, he said. Peter's chest pulsed hot. Appa's hand dropped from the harrow. What? Martin gestured toward the west. The fields there belong to the collective farm. I know, Appa said. Martin pointed toward the stream to the east and the fields that lay this side of it. And also there, he said. No, Appa said, that's Jakob Kozma's land. Kozma joined the collective yesterday, Martin said. He is supporting the economic plan. Appa stared at Martin. So you see, Martin said, there is collective property on either side. The economic plan calls for communal farms to have contiguous land. The collective will work this land now. He jerked his thumb toward the lower field that had belonged to Jakob Kozma. There is yours. Peter had walked that land. A good third of it was nothing better than pig mud. His hand closed taut on the reins. The mare tossed her head, the gelding sidestepped, the harness jerked. Peter clutched the mare's halter. Ho, he ordered the horses, hearing the choke in his own voice. Abba grasped the harrow again. My son and I already planted this field, he said. We have work to do here. Peter, forward, go. But the big police officer in back pulled the billy club out of his service belt and thumped it in the palm of his hand. Work this land if you want to, citizen, he said, but the harvest belongs to the collective. The three turned and walked away with only the short deputy turning once to look back. And I'll stop there. Very good, I like it. It's, Thank you. Yeah, I, I when you said the grim triangle, I, I love that uh, that metaphor. Very, very good. I'm like, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> that's a good way to put it. Uh, so, so that that kind of scenario with the you know the state car coming, the three men coming out and informing the farmers that they're losing their land and being relocated to a lesser, not agriculturally prominent land. It was pretty common. Yes, it was. And they switch you out you get inferior land or you simply get thrown off it. In the case of wealthy peasants, uh, and they weren't all that wealthy, but in the case of peasants who had a fair amount of land and so had more income, they very often got thrown in prison. Well, that's terrible. Yeah. So they said, uh... So who's working the land then? So they said it was a collective for the collective now. So who's working the land? Some the of the other, some of the other neighbors that had kind of come together, uh, uh, kind of forced in by the government, and oh, okay. uh, and the situation was that they would take away part of your property to where you had so little that you needed some kind of protection, and so even though. At this stage, it was still optional. They made it extremely difficult to actually live on what was left to you. Yeah, voluntold kind of a thing. Right. Right. That's yeah. That's all. That always works really well. It sounds like an incredible story. So, what feedback have you gotten from from your first novel? People love the book by and large. Um, and it's it's really gratifying to me to um, hear people say, wow, I you know just really loved it and learned so much. They they really like the characters in the story and and get caught up in the story. One comment that I often hear from Americans is wow, I I didn't know how bad things were. But they appreciated that that I did incorporate some hope into the story, too. And one thing that I often heard from Hungarians is, first off, they thanked me for writing it, They, which was really wonderful to hear. One thing that several of them said to me, which I was really glad to hear, was that they, they felt that I had 
portrayed Hungary and Hungarian life very accurately, which was wonderful because I had worked really hard at that. So that was great to know that it had actually worked. Oh, yeah. Well, it, I mean, it definitely helped. Those interviews probably helped. And going to Hungary itself, I can yeah. only imagine just that insurmountable help with with getting the idea, the mindset, the concepts just of Hungary, of the Hungarian people into into the into your books are they pretty are they pretty kind of a stoic group or are they uh expressive or yes both i think they would characterize themselves as fairly pessimistic oh really uh, which is a a hard thing but they are intelligent they are emotive they are creative people the hungarians tend to have tend to have done marvelous things in science and medicine so those who have been able to get a good good education have really done wonderful things for the world. But their country has always been basically between Germany and Russia, which is a place you don't want to be. <laughs> and Not um, back then. <laughs> right. So much earlier in their history, uh, they had a long occupation from the Turkish Empire. So a lot of difficulty during their history. So they've been under the thumb quite a bit. Yes. Yes. Okay. So the pessimism is not exactly, you know, unwarranted. This kind of, right. <laughs> they have a long history of, hey, this happened. Well, then this happened again. Well, this happened now. <laughs> you know, I'm no better. But I'm not, you know, I'm no gambler. However. Right. Uh, yeah. They, so I, I can see how, are, that would, how that'd be. They're wonderful, strong people though. Yeah. Um, and I, I loved the people that I interviewed they were mm-hmm. terrific and they were they were surprised mm-hmm. that I was interested in their country but they were really glad that I was I'm sure they were just tickled pink the fact that someone you know especially not a non-hungarian uh, american was interested in really capturing their culture and what they yeah. went through yeah so that's that's pretty cool is there did you, have you heard of any you know famous or well renowned hungarian authors or anything like that you know, very often their work will get translated into German, but a lot of times it doesn't get translated into um, English very much. So okay. unfortunately, there um, I have read some some wonderful literature, some wonderful Hungarian literature, but there isn't a whole lot of it that's available in English. But I will recommend one terrific writer who's no longer living. His name is Shandor Maroy, which is spelled M-A-R-A-I. He's fabulous. But only a, only a couple of his books have been translated into English. Okay, okay. Well, that's, that's still good if anyone's interested in, in Hungarian culture or maybe they are Hungarian themselves and they want to read from a Hungarian's perspective wouldn't be a bad idea to check that that individual out as well and right, then right. obviously your books too would definitely help capture the uh the essence of what was going on back then during that yeah. turbulent time that's for that's for sure uh so with with i love with historical fiction they don't all people don't always use uh the names of the actual historical their counterparts uh did you use the historical names or did you find different different names for your characters Yeah, that's a great question. Um, So in the songs we hide, I make reference to a couple of historical figures and used their names, but they are not, they are not characters in my book. Okay. Certainly, I refer fairly often to Matthias uh, Rakoshi, who was the Hungarian dictator at that time. But uh, I love it that you asked a question about the names because <laughs> coming up with names for my characters was challenging because a lot of the Hungarian names, uh, American readers would look at how it's spelled and have no idea how to pronounce it. It's not as not nearly as difficult as, say, Polish, but still, I stuck with names that at least the reader would be able to figure out pretty much how it's pronounced. And my main character is named Peter, which is pronounced Peter there. Oh, okay. Um, so, but it's the same, spelled the same. 
Sure, sure. We're, we'll Americanize it and call him sure. Peter while we're reading the book. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> right, if that right. was ever made into a movie, it would be it would be obviously yeah. <laughs> as closely to the Hungarian pronunciation as possible. Yeah, that's yeah, that would be very challenging to try to. Yeah, you want to you want to get the essence of what's going on. You don't want to take any take anything away, but you also want the you know the main reader base to yeah be able to read the name and not get hung up on that because yes, and I wanted to be able to pronounce it. <laughs> when i had to read it aloud to people i don't blame you because i've i've read a couple of stories you know fiction and whatnot yeah. who've had a weird character name and i get hung up on that and i can't like in my head stop to go i just can't let it flow i yeah. get hung up it's like right. a roadblock or a right. little hiccup right. and i have to stop look at it again and and go so that's that's very conscientious of you to think about the of of your reader base <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> while we're reading so as any new writers are coming up or maybe someone who's wanting to do historical fiction really anybody who's starting out wanting to become an author any suggestions uh for writing historical fiction or just writing at all i think that for for people writing fiction at all no matter what genre it is i think one of the best things you can do is to find at least a couple other people who are writing sort of the same kind of fiction that you are writing. And so you can share your work with each other, give each other feedback. I think it is important that it be someone who at least appreciates that kind of literature. Because if, if you are writing historical fiction and the other person is writing paranormal romances or something like that, chances are you're not going to like the same kind of thing and it doesn't really work to critique each other's work. And then I think it's really important to be willing to revise quite a bit because you only get part of it right the first time through and revision helps a lot. Mm -hmm. But advice about writing historical fiction is do your research really well and choose a topic that you are so interested in that you don't mind doing the research mm -hmm. because it it is very time consuming and if you're bored with it you're not going to stick with it no. so yeah that's great advice for anyone who's uh, getting into uh, getting the writing bug and starting to hopefully get their own work in progress is uh, done. So thank you for those suggestions. One of my last questions will be, uh, what do you hope people will get from reading your book or learn from reading your book? I, I really hope they will come to understand more what happened after the war and how the people in the Soviet bloc suffered. This was not just Hungary, but also uh, Czechoslovakia. East Germany and Poland, and very difficult stories, very difficult. And those hardships that they went through, you know, have continued to affect their history. So I would love it if people reading my book would just kind of come to more of an understanding of how difficult things have been for that part of Europe. And perhaps to try to have more patience. I know people have been upset. Uh, people here in the U.S. and in Western Europe have been upset, for example, with the leaders of Poland and Hungary for good reason. However, those countries have been through very difficult times and, uh, you know, have not been able to trust neighbors as much as you know, other countries perhaps have. And so, so it really affects the way they interact with other countries. Yeah. So just having more grace for the grace and understanding and empathy for those, for those around them, especially uh, international neighbors and right. uh, understanding right. history a bit better. It always, it always helps knowing the full story of what someone went through. Yes. It really does just have that sympathy for somebody going, Hey, you know, he's, he's kind of cranky, but this is why he's cranky. So, I mean, understand right. that, understand yeah. that. Just give him a minute. We'll talk about it. Don't get mad at him. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, I like that. That's great. So for everybody listening out there, who's been here, talk, uh, sticking it out with us all the way through, 
to the end of the interview uh, and are very interested in just, you know, really wanting to get a hold of your book, where can they do that? It is on Amazon. And again, the title is The Songs We Hide. It is under my name, which is my author name, which is Connie Hampton Connolly. It's also on my website, and that is ConnieHamptonConnolly.com. And I believe, at least for a while, it was also available in the Tacoma Public Library and in the Pierce County Public Library system. I, I don't know if it is still there, but but you can check. <laughs> awesome. And so if they order off your website, do they get uh, a, a signed copy from you? I hadn't thought about that. No, I don't. I don't have signed copies to send people. But if they are local and would like to just write me via my website and say, hey, I have a copy of your book, we will make it happen. Oh, cool. That's good. I know a lot of people love love getting signed copies from authors. And then I know uh, uh, you and I met at a car show selling our books and everything. So uh, if if anyone's out there and sees uh, people selling books, there's a good chance that uh, Connie will probably be there to sell her books and you can get her to sign them there as well. So yes. Awesome. Well, Connie, this has been fabulous. I've learned quite a bit already just from our little conversation. I really appreciate you coming on and chatting with us today. Thank you, Ryan. Well, from everyone here at Mighty Books Podcast, I hope everyone has a great day and get out there and uh, keep reading, everybody. Have a great day. Are you an author? Do you know someone who is? If so, then message me, Ryan Oliver, at ryanmoliver.com to set up a free appointment to discuss being showcased on the Mighty Books Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe to the Mighty Books YouTube channel and share the link to this and more episodes with your friends and family. Thanks for listening. So long for now. Stay mighty and keep reading.